How design can be used both in policy and practice to deliver better quality spaces and places. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we mean by design in the round. I'll highlight some examples um, of emerging best practice in this area. And I'll also suggest some ways we could perhaps apply these examples to achieve the aims of this conference, to inform Habitat 3 and to deliver these places and spaces we've been talking about. Oh. So to briefly orientate you about where I've come from, um, I'm from the UK Design Council. We're a charity that exists only for public benefit. Um, in 2011, we merged with CAVE, the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, which some of you may have heard of. Um, CAVE was set up by the UK government following a report by Lord Richard Rogers, um, the Urban Task Force. Um, whose aims were to establish a vision for Britain's cities based on principles of design excellence, social well-being and economic responsibility. Over the last 15 years, CAVE and now the Design Council have worked with all participants in placemaking, from governments at central and local level, developers of all varieties and also, more importantly, I would say, uh, communities themselves to create these places and spaces we've been talking about. And you may have also have heard of our CAVE Space Unit, which focused entirely on the urban realm, um, delivering advice to government, new research, and also developing best practice. Um, I should also say for the benefits, of, for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to um, differentiate good place making with creating good quality space to cope, because I don't think you can separate the two. So, <laughs> This is our charitable objective, as I've just described, um, creating, well, improving lives um, through design. And in terms of our focus, um, really we look to apply design methodologies to tackle the really big issues facing societies across the world, um, be they stimulating business growth, transforming public services, or creating the places that we've been talking about here at this conference. Um, and I also just wanted to touch on the fact that we do now work internationally, um, which means that the best practice that we've um, developed in the UK is now being applied abroad and also evolving, dependent on the place and the situation and the culture that it's tackling. Um, we're working with various countries, including Oman and um, southern Australia, so obviously those places have very different issues that they're trying to tackle and also cultures. So what do we mean by design? I thought I'd start from a quote, or with a quote, from um, Every Designer's um, pin-up, Steve Jobs. Um, our understanding of design is that it's a process, not just an output. Design is a method or a, sense or a set of principles which are profoundly human-centered and at the core of everything that we do at the Design Council. Through design, we help to uncover the real needs of people and to deliver better quality products services, places and spaces. And relevant to this discussion here at this conference, design, as we've touched on many times, is a powerful tool to engage those communities that we've been talking about, the user of the places and spaces. So specifically to do with places, um, having looked at the documents produced by the drafting committee, the World Urban Campaigns, the city we live in, and of course the UN Habitat's vision for Habitat 3, which was produced in 2013. I think there's three key areas where design could play a real role. Firstly, around national urban policy. Second, around the local fiscal systems. And thirdly, around this investment in basic urban services. So to, so to begin with the first, national urban policy, it may sound obvious to us all here today, but it's absolutely critical that national planning policy includes a requirement to achieve good design through the planning process, that there's a requirement for those developments to create better quality places for all. In addition, it's also key that these planning policies are backed up by guidance that defines what we mean by a good quality place and space, and it's issues and assets that we've been talking about today, so that they're sustainable, inclusive, and resilient. So what can be done? It's not enough to make the case to government to require good design in their national policy. It's also critical that those governments are equipped with the tools that they need to deliver through the planning process. 
So for example, the UK government recently um, revamped its own national planning policy and made a requirement for good design to be achieved through planning. Um, not only did it do this, it also recognised the tools that are needed um, to do so, um, including design review, which some of you may use in this room. Design review is a proven method of improving the quality of development by bringing together a panel of multidisciplinary experts um, in order to provide advice to those decision makers about what good design looks like so they can make better decisions. Design review is helping schemes across the world to be better and helping those decision makers. And I've, I've met friends here at this conference in Australia, Canada and America that are using design review to improve the quality of their schemes in their countries. And I just thought I'd flag some examples of where this has really worked in the UK. Uh, the first top left is the Shard and the London Bridge development, so big iconic infrastructure examples there. This is the London 2012 Olympic Park where design review um, really helped set the bar for design quality um, in the delivery of that park, but it's also now helping to secure the legacy for the communities in the surrounding area. And of course, public space here, um, design review creates spaces where people are comfortable enough to take their shoes off, as you can see in the side above, but also helps people to walk on water in the one just here. So we've talked briefly about um, how design can help individual schemes themselves. I wanted to look at how design can also help cities deliver their vision for places at a strategic level. So in the UK, moves to devolve powers to a local level have seen a renewed focus on the socio-economic -return, socio return from investment in the built environment. And here's why. This research from Centre for Cities demonstrates the economic values of cities in the UK, and I'm sure it's the same story across the globe. Cities in the UK, through devolution, are now being granted new planning powers and funding to deliver new housing and infrastructure <coughs> to stimulate local economic growth. It was therefore critical for us at the Design Council to look at how we could help make sure that this public investment in the built environment delivered maximum impact for the citizens. Recognising this potential, we've been working with cities at the strategic level to help them bring forward the development they need to become attractive places where businesses want to locate, but also they, that attract the people that can work there. This includes mechanisms that I've touched on, such as design review, but also um, we're now seeking to build capacity within those cities through training for decision makers and also tools to put Part, um, sorry, excuse me, to f facilitate genuine participation. <clears throat> so at this conference, we've naturally focused on the built environment, um, but I also wanted to touch on public service design. To create truly sustainable places, it's impossible to do so without looking at the design of our public services. For example, how can we really create a successful public space hospital or school without working first with the user to look at their needs. At the Design Council, we're now looking at how we can integrate the design of the built environment with the design of our public services. In an age of austerity, we're working with local governments using design to tackle frontline challenges to co-design better public services with the people that use them. This requires government to have the confidence to create the space for that innovation, but also to break down the traditional silos that exist between the different designing communities. By integrating our approach to place and public service design, we can start to demonstrate how good quality places can deliver objectives across government departments. For example, in the UK we're facing huge challenges, um, health challenges, through um, inactivity and bad diet. To address this, we've been working with cities, developers and the communities themselves to look at how we can really start to encourage physical activity in the built environment, to start looking at how we can change that to improve health outcomes. And some of you may have heard of Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool, which was a great example of where a hospital was redesigning um, its services and it looked at the assets around it, which included a public park 
um, and they brought that park into the um, redevelopment in order to really promote health and well-being aspects. And I should also say that this isn't anything new, this is happening across the world. So in America, you've got the Office for Urban Mechanics in the Boston Mayor's Office that are looking at both the physical and the public service design here. So in conclusion, um, there's three areas really where I think there could be a real opportunity for design here. One is around um, national urban policy, making it a requirement in those national policies for a good design. Two, around local fiscal systems. How do you really um, use the built environment to support these? Um, and at a strategic level, I think it's key to have those tools embedded in policy, such as design review. And three, um, looking at public service design, really starting to integrate um, the design of our built space with our public services. So there's something uh, I hope that stimulates debate there. Thank you.